Haven't War Memorial, standing here since 1922. It's been a significant architectural and cultural landmark, yet looking around me, it seems as though it's totally ignored. Everyone's caught up in their own lives. Right now, it should be more significant than ever, as it symbolises the sacrifices made a hundred years ago. The sacrifices that allow for this bustling lifestyle going on around me. So many names, so many walks of life. I often wonder how these brave soldiers spent their days walking the same streets as I do before they left to fight a war. The popularity of names has changed so much. Archibald Francis Campbell Paxton, a major Sir Frederick Loftus Francis Fitzwigram, who died in 1920. Though if the war finished in 1918, how could this be? And how can I possibly ignore the irony of there being a deadman on a war memorial? Ernest Deadman. It's my aim to remind Havant of the symbolic importance this memorial holds. I'm Holly Patrick, and this is Havant's Heroes. I'm no historian, but after seeing the endless amounts of family tree adverts on television, I'm certainly no stranger to it all. Let's see what we can find out about Ernest. The census from 1911, living in Warblington, Hampshire. Looks like it could be him. A postcard from Ernest. It's uploaded recently by a Miss Jackie Shields. I wonder if she could be a relative. I'll leave my email and my mobile number just in case she wants to contact me. While waiting for Jackie to get in touch, I have come to the spring in heaven to meet James McInnes, who can tell me more about Fitzwigram. James, thank you for meeting oh, with me here today. I know pleasure. you're very busy. Um, thank you for responding to me so quickly. I know that you're a local historian in the mm -hmm. area and you know a lot about the Haven and Lee Park area. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. just wondering if you'd tell me a bit more about the Fitzwigram family. Ah, yes, the Fitzwigram family. They owned the whole of what is now the Lee Park estate, right the way through from Havant uh, north towards Rowlands Castle. And it was Sir Frederick Loftus Francis Fitzwigram's father who, in fact, bought the estate at auction in 1874 and improved it considerably. He was particularly interested in gardening and uh, spent a lot of time working on the estate. And when he died in 1904, his son, the Sir Frederick you're interested in, um, took over. But at that time, he was still very, very young. In fact, he hadn't even gone up to Eton College yet. So he was only a young boy. So when you say the estate, was this their estate mm. here? That was part of their estate, but ideally you want to go up to Hampshire Record Office in Winchester because they have got a large number of very detailed papers which I think you will be interested in seeing and you'd learn a lot more about the family if you went there. That would be great, mm. yeah, no, definitely. One more thing that really caught my mm. attention on the Haven't War Memorial was that Sir Frederick died in 1920, mm -hmm. so that's after the war had finished. Mm. I, I don't understand why he was on mm. there. Yes, Sir Frederick um, died in 1920, and I'm afraid this is one of the great pub quiz questions. <laughs> when did the First World War end? <laughs> We know that on the 11th of November 1918, there was the armistice, but that's only an agreement to stop fighting. So the Imperial War Graves Commission, what is now the Commonwealth War, uh, War Graves Commission, decided there has to be a start and an end point, and they decided that the 4th of August 1914, which is when Britain declared war on Germany, was going to be the start point, and the end point was going to be the 31st of August 1921. Mm. So declaration of war was on the 4th of August 1914. So if you were um, killed or died as a result of your wounds from the 4th of August 1914 until, and they chose the 31st of August 1921, if you were still a serving soldier, airman or in the Navy, then you could be on the war memorial. So whereas naturally you would think, oh, it's just privilege that I bought Fitzwigram a place on the war memorial, that would be completely incorrect. He's there because that is what the Imperial War Graves Commission said was acceptable. The information that James McInnes has already given me is invaluable, but now I want to widen my knowledge, so I'm heading to Lee Park Gardens to meet with Maury, the education officer. 
Maury works at Stoughton Country Park, who also own the land that the Fitzwigrams house once stood on. And I'm hoping Maury can shed some light on the Fitzwigrams and their family and the sort of lives that they would have led. The family was dedicated to their workers. Yeah. You know, they treated their workers well, you know, and, and everything they done. They used to go to church on Sunday, come back, visit all the neighbours. Wow. All the neighbors. Well, they weren't neighbours, they were his estate workers, you know. And also, when he first took here, there were a lot of men that were with him in the Crimea War. He employed them on the estate. So he really work, cared? To work with him. He was a caring man, you know, for everybody in, in the community. That's so lovely to know. You often come across people that are a hierarchy, a lot higher up, with a lot more money, and they don't care about the people underneath. Yeah, respected. He was a, one of the biggest respected family on that owned this estate. So I know you mentioned previously when we met up at Haven Art Spring Centre that Sir Frederick was um, a prisoner of war in World War One. but what would have his overall experience been? Um, he took part in the Battle of Festubert in uh, May 1915 and on the second day of that battle um, at about ten past three in the morning he and a small group of his men uh, marched or walked towards the German lines. Wow. They managed to get through uh, to the German trenches but what they hadn't taken account of the fact of was that not only was there fire coming from the Germans, unfortunately the British were shelling, and the British were shelling based on map positions. Oh. They didn't realise that their men had got so far forward, so they were being shelled by their own people, which caused a lot of deaths, and they were also, of course, being attacked by the Germans. But he and uh, three other men managed to get into the German trenches, doing very, very well, and, of course, eventually they get uh, captured. The rest of his group uh, were all killed. And it was for that action. Uh, he was, in fact, awarded the Military Cross. Yeah. And, of course, having been captured, from then on, he is uh, a prisoner of war. So, Maury, you were saying that Sir Frederick's father was a keen gardener here, um, right up until his death, but when he passed away, he would have taken over that legacy? Yeah, well, Loftus would have taken it over then, up, up until his death, which he died of blood poisoning. Uh, contacted actually when hedging on this estate, no. which is very sad, really. But so he, uh, he, he would have done it up to his up to his death. Yeah. So he was here gardening, and you yeah. say that he was yeah. pruning or hedging, and he was hedging at the time, presumably cutting a finger or something Cut like finger. that, mm -hmm. and uh, then um, contacted blood poisoning and uh, mm. and died as a result of that. Sir Frederick Loftus Fitzwigram received a grand funeral in Havant before being laid to rest in the family grave in the cemetery at St John's Church in Rowlands Castle. A respected member of the community and a war hero. I'm just composing an email to Anne Griffiths, the local historian in Havant and also the author of Havant Rolls of Honour. I'm trying to find out some more details about our second name, Ernest Edmund, and I'm just wondering if she's got any information for me. I've received a phone call from Jackie Shields explaining that she is indeed a descendant from Ernest Edmund. We made arrangements to meet at a later date. Anne Griffiths, the author of Haven't's Roll of Honour, has agreed to meet with me at her home in Langston. So Anne, it's lovely to meet you and thank you for having me here today in your home in Langston, taking time out of your day to meet me. Um, I emailed you recently about the research that I'm doing with the Havant War Memorial and one name that really stood out to me, probably because of the irony that it carries, is Ernest Dedman. Um, I know a little bit about him from the booklet that you've written. However, I don't know that much and I was just wondering if you could tell me a bit more about his family. Well, the family lived in the old mill, which is round the corner from here. This is a, how it would have looked when they were living here. And this is a rather interesting picture because it shows wow. Mrs. Deadman feeding the chickens. Oh. It's from a painting. That's really beautiful. Now, Ernest Deadman, here's the family. Ernest Deadman isn't in this picture because he was no longer alive, unfortunately. But here we have Mrs. Deadman, Mr. Deadman, who was a cowman. Oh. The four older sons who were all in the Navy. So could you just tell me a little bit more about Ernest Edmund himself? Right, this is a picture of Ernest in his uniform. He was in the Royal Field Artillery as a gunner and he spent two years 
serving in France. Before he went to war, he was a gardener. A lot of the young men were gardeners because people had big gardens, was so they needed someone to work for them. Yes. Oh, OK. But he spent two years in France, and during that time he got scabies and oh, was hospitalised. Oh. But much worse than that, in 1917, he, he received very serious gunshot wounds to the face, leg and spine. And he was brought home to England and put into a hospital in London, King George Hospital in Stamford Street in London. Oh. And he was discharged there later on in the year and sent to another hospital, but we don't quite know where he went because he had to sleep on a waterbed. Gosh, and, and that was sort of the only treatment yes, they had for Yes, him. so he would have had to go on where he could have slept on a waterbed so he could receive treatment day and night. How had his fa family sort of taken this? And... Well, Mrs Deadman, she was a very good soul and she spent all the war working in the hospital here, just round the corner. There's a hospital? Yes, there was a hospital here. It was run by the Red Cross. Wow. Yes, they had about 1,430 patients in throughout the war. Langston? Yes, yes. That's just incredible. down the end of this road. In fact, we're sitting in the garden. No. Yes, we are. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. During World War I, Langston Towers was used as an auxiliary military hospital with up to 46 beds. Many local women became nurses and served in the hospital. The Deadman family lived locally and certainly helped out. But another one of our family names, Paxton, played a larger role. Archibald Paxton's mother, Lucy, was a very important figure here. Right, well now this is the Red Cross Hospital and this would have been one of the wards. This room here? That's right. What sort of patients would they have treated? Oh, well, they had all sorts of things wrong with them. Most of them had gunshot wounds. Some of them had been gas poisoned, others were suffering from shell shock or malaria, all kinds of things. So can you just tell me a little bit more about Lucy Paxton and the work she did here? Well, she was the commandant and she had a quartermaster called Nora Lewis. And then under that she had two staff nurses who were trained and the rest were volunteers. Wow, so they sort of learnt as they were going along. But of course she had her daughter here, Nellie. She was a trained nurse, I think. Oh, wow. So the mother and daughter yes. were working together throughout the war. Yes. So was Lucy Paxton quite close to her children? Yes, she was. In fact, she used to write an Archie throughout the war, and he wrote her as well. And if you go up to Epsom College, where he was at school, I believe they have the archives there, and you'll be able to read the letters for yourself. I'm keen to learn more about Archibald Paxton, and I've arranged to go to Epsom College to meet Alan Scadding, the archivist. Our journey so far looking at Paxton has led us to Epsom College, and I know that he was a student here, but I don't know much else about him. Well, actually, we can tell a lot about him. Uh, we have all sorts of records here of his time in the school. He grew from someone who, according to his housemaster, lacked a little bit in, um, in confidence. Oh, really? This is in, uh, um, the, um, uh, in 1911. His housemaster is saying he's so self-distrustful oh. and loses heart very easily but is not idle or really slack about it. Now that's in 1911, but by about 1914, we can see him swaggering back <laughs> from cricket, <laughs> looking very much master of the universe. And I think that that shows that the college was doing a pretty good job. And in fact, this is him in the first 11, later on, oh, wow. when he's become quite an important figure in the school. Uh, here he is. Archie wanted to be a doctor, okay. as many of the boys here became doctors. High aspirations for him. Then. Absolutely. But unfortunately, he wasn't going to pass his exam. Oh, no. <laughs> this is a, a, a letter from the headmaster in 1915, in uh, March the 8th, 1915, to Major Paxton. And he says, I feel the time has come to write to you about your boy, his reports make it quite clear that he cannot possibly pass the first medical examination. Oh, my gosh. How would the family have felt about that when receiving the letter? Well, as most families, they would have regrouped and um, they would have thought of another good thing. But I think the headmaster had already got this sewn up. Still supportive, then? Very supportive. If one thing doesn't work, this is the other thing 
that might work. But there is a, a, a definite uh, feeling that he wants to join the army. Now, most of his family were in the army. And indeed, his brother was already commissioned into the army in 1915. Um, the headmaster goes on to offer him a nomination to Sandhurst, which was going to accelerate his army career. So do you think perhaps in a way his, his parents already preempted that he probably would join the military? I think they might have known exactly what he wanted to do, mm. but hoped that he might be a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Parents are complicated. <laughs> so, he, so he gets to Sandhurst, on to Gillingham, and then, very quickly, we find him on the Somme. Here, in a letter to his, his mother, it shows that uh, in May, actually, 1916, uh, he was already uh, meeting his uh, new colleagues on the Somme and going straight to the frontline trenches. I arrived here at last in this district yesterday and happened to be posted to the one company that is present in the trenches. Present in the trenches. My part of the line is rather lively and probably set to get a whole lot livelier. I have missed your letters, but I know the post here is very erratic. Give my love to everyone. My very best love to you, your loving son, Archie. Millions of men were um, training in the army and the first group of those were going to be fighting in this new big push. So this was going to be the Battle of the Somme. And we know a lot about Paxton's part in this, partly because his family gathered information. Uh, and here we have a copy of his orders for the day. And it shows that he's intended to attack Frickor Farm. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, he seems to have gone on advancing. They advanced around the side and right up towards Montauban. And we know this because we know where Paxton fell on the 1st of July, 1916. Of course, as he goes forward, one of the most amazing things is that we have his dog tanks. Wow. <laughs> and he'd have been wearing these as he fell. Yes. Yeah. And here is a photograph of his original grave. Wow. And this is where he fell. He would have been just buried. Buried in this grave. And if you look at it, many other people are buried in the same shell hole. Would Paxton have been perceived as a, as a war hero for progressing? No. No? He would have been perceived as just another young man doing what he'd been brought up to do. Lovely to me. I'm Holly. So I was just wondering if you could tell me how you became a relative of Ernest Edmund. My mother was born in Havant, and her mother, um, her parents were George Edmund and Mary Blackman, um, and she had a brother, which had a number of brothers, one of which was Ernest Edmund. I was wondering if you'd like to accompany me in some of the places that Ernest would have lived and been and enjoyed his life. That would be fantastic. We could even start in the old mill. The Dedman family lived in part of the old mill at Langston. According to the census, Ernest's father George was an agricultural labourer. Now a residential property, the owners have given us permission to look around. The mill was just a stone's throw away from Langston Towers Hospital. We know that before joining up, Ernest worked as a gardener for Mr Pratt, a grocer, in Chief House in the centre of Havant. Ernest enlisted on the 19th of April, 1915, and served in France for two years before being wounded. He 
he was discharged physically unfit on the 27th of September, 1917. We have come to the Hampshire Archive in Winchester, where the records for Langston Towers Hospital are preserved. So Jackie and I earlier went to see Sheaf House, which is where Ernest would have worked, but where is Sheaf House on the map? Okay, it would have been about here, just a little bit further down West Street from the church, St. Pate's, and this map is pre-war memorial. Oh, okay, and we know that Ernest was worked for a greengrocer, so would have the vegetables that they supplied would they have fed the patients at Langston Towers? Almost certainly. Um, Langston Towers is here, and we've got the windmill tower where Ernest lived just there. I have a postcard that was sent to Ernest's sister, um, who was my grandmother, and I've got a scanned copy of it here oh, for wow. you to have a look at. And on the back is just a few words just probably just before he went into battle. I wanted to show you a collection of documents that we have that relate to Langston Towers. Uh, these came to us in 1981 and we have a variety of things including some photographs here. This one shows some of the uh, patients and staff actually in Langston Towers and then another one of uh, the staff outside. And this is the hospital itself? It is. I was here yesterday oh. at these exact arches. It's amazing to see that they're still there. It is, yeah. yeah. And then underneath we've got another photograph of the staff. This shows uh, the nursing staff. This lady here was Lucy Paxton, who was the commandant. As in the mother of Archibald Paxton? Yep, the same one. Yeah. Wow. And here we've got a list of the staff and you can see here at the top Commandant Lucy Paxton and then a little bit further down you've got her daughter Nellie who took over as Commandant and here we've got uh, Miss Angela Fitzwigram and the Fitzwigrams owned Lee Park, the estate that we looked at on the map. And this was the sister of Sir Frederick Fitzwigram? Yes, that's right. So all the relatives sort of worked and knew each other, maybe even socialised together? They certainly knew each other. And here we've got a document that shows their mother, Lady Fitzwigram, who was vice president when the VAD unit was first set up. That's just incredible. And this is the letter, Jackie, that I wanted you to see that refers to Ernest and uh, I'll read it out for you. Dear Sir, E. Deadman, Old Mill House, Langston, Havant. With reference to my letter of the first, I have now received the following letter from the Registrar of the King George Hospital. And then he quotes, I am in receipt of your letter of the first, with reference to number 64542, driver Ernest Deadman, RFA, and beg to inform you that the British Red Cross Society are trying to make arrangements for his admission to a hospital near his home, and they will undertake expenses incurred in connection with his maintenance there. This is, I regret to say, a very serious case of gunshot wound of the spine and paraplegia and will require most careful and constant skilled nursing day and night. And he will also have to lie on a waterbed, so it is desirable to get him to a permanent home where he can be suitably looked after. Under these conditions, possibly the VA hospital at Langston, Havant, will not be a suitable place for him to be sent to. And then signed yours faithfully, C. Scott, Secretary. What I'd like to say is that we're just very proud of him and thank him for what he's done. Yeah, good. So Ernest was too severely hurt to go to the Langston Towers? He was. Basically, uh, his wounds were so severe, he was paralysed and they simply didn't have the facilities or the staff to be able to care for him. 
But if he had gone there, he would have met Lucy and Angela and Nelly, who they all lived in the same area and sort of fought, perhaps not together, but they were in fighting for the same cause. That's true, that's true. But I think possibly in the end, um, it was the best thing for Ernest. Ernest Edmund finally died of his injuries on the 15th of January, 1920, aged 24. He was laid to rest in Warblington Cemetery. This must be quite difficult for you. Yes, but I'm not sad. I'm just very proud of him, really. On this journey, we've discovered some truly amazing stories and really placed a spotlight on some fascinating people. From fearless majors, courageously leading troops right into the heart of the German trenches, to young soldiers valiantly steeping ahead into arguably one of the most brutal and bloody battles in history. The memorial signifies the very heroes that sacrificed their own dreams and desires for the benefit of me and you. Through uncovering these inspiring tales of Havant's brave men, However, a key aspect of Britain's success was amplified by the role of women. From taking over the jobs left by men to nursing the waves and waves of injured soldiers, women were vital cogs in the machine, and this is something we must not forget. We must also remember all of the soldiers that would have returned to these shores. They may have carried on with their lives and found happiness, but they would have never forgotten the horrors. So next time you walk past a memorial, as well as admiring and appreciating, try and remember those names that aren't displayed on the wall and aren't shown in the same way, but are just as important. <laughs>